Good morning. This is Studio 4 at the Television Centre. It's 11 o'clock and this is Making the Most of the Micro live. <laughs> You may wonder why we're doing this programme live. Well, there are two reasons. Firstly, the previous two series gave an impression that everything to do with computers worked perfectly every time in a cool, logical environment. The truth was, if anything could go wrong, it would go wrong, and usually it did. And even the slightest slip led to some form of chaos. Anyone who's used a micro knows really that this is true. So today, we're showing reality, warts and all. Secondly, over 300,000 people wrote letters to the project asking for advice. And today, there's a unique chance for coders, tech freaks and even ordinary nice people to put questions to our specialists in software, hardware and telecommunications right here in the studio. If you have a question, ring 01 811 8055. And finally, we thought it might be a lot of fun. John Colley's with us again today, trying to find someone to send a message to using British Telecom's electronic mail service. John. Yes, and if you're already a subscriber to British Telecom Gold, why don't you send us a message and we'll read some of them out during the programme. Our mailbox number is owl, O-W-L, 001, but you won't be able to chat to us during the show. And there's almost an open invitation to hackers to have a go, and we'll let you know what they are later on. And by popular request, we've got Dave Ellis, who'll be making music, and the weirdest sounds out of a pile of electronic junk linked to a micro. Just wait for that. We'll be showing how the BBC Micro can be used for subtitling, like this, and how you can do it. And Richard Fothergill will be showing us some of the latest educational programmes. At around 20 to 1, we'll have an interview with Kenneth Baker, the Minister for Information Technology, and he'll be launching a national software competition for schools with over £25,000 of prizes. Well, over here are the bravest people in the show. In a moment, they're going to throw themselves at their machines from three different manufacturers and write a programme in hot blood. It's not supposed to be a competition, but a real look at how pros set about programming a problem they haven't seen before. Ian Trackman set the challenge, and here it is. They haven't seen it before, and I'm sure they're all eager to find out. The task. Write a programme to produce an animated advertising display showing small ads, such as you would see in a local newsagent's window. Well, you have... There's yours. There's yours. And there's yours. You have two hours to do that, and we've got the latest piece of silicon technology here to actually time it for you. One timer. Two hours to go. Well, happy coding, the lot of you. We'll come back to you later and see how you're getting on. They're already at it. There are over a million micros in Britain, apparently more per head than in any other country. They're so commonplace, you can even buy them from your newsagent. Peter? No, I'm afraid I don't. Well, yes. It's a BBC Model B with the disc interface and disc system and a Juki printer to tie in with it. Uh, yeah, I don't really know anything about them, but they seem pretty logical to the children. My school in particular has two uh, pet computers. I have a Commodore 64 and I use for games, half for games and half for programming. We tend to sell games primarily, um, even at this time, and they behave increasingly like chart singles. I mean, they, they have four or six weeks of popularity and then they're replaced by something else quite different. You really don't have to advertise too much to children. I mean, word of mouth is sufficient um, to transform a, an unknown game into, into a hit almost overnight. 
most of the software we sell at the moment is on cassette. Um, there's quite likely to be an increasing proportion on, on ROM cartridge and on disc in the next two years. Well, happily, people rapidly get bored with games. I suppose for the people who write them, it's great because they can continue writing them as almost an infinite market. Now's the time for our phone-in. It's Jack, it's off. And we have a call from Mrs Eileen Schoen on line one. Hello, Mrs Schoen. Hello. Good morning. What's Good morning. your question? My question is, in articles on computing, it's often said that it's inadvisable to learn basic, as it inculcates wrong habits of thinking, which have to be unlearned later. Does the panel agree? What sort of wrong habits have you got in mind? Well, I don't know. They never say exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel they're the, the high priests at the university who don't really want to let other people in, except they are going to teach them themselves. And I wondered if the panel agreed with this. What do you think, Ian? Um, well, the, the, uh, what these high priests, so-called high priests, are getting at is some, something that they like to call structured programming. Um, the idea behind that is to write a program in such a way that it's very easy to construct the program and if anything should go wrong later, it's very easy to put it right. Now, BASIC is a very bad language for structured programming. Um, on the other hand, it's a very easy language to learn. It's a very good language to get started in coding. I'm getting a lot of nods of agreement from our panel. Henry Budget's a software consultant. Henry, would you agree with that? Certainly, yes. The basic language is ideal for beginners. There's nothing wrong with it at all. And even the, well, the BBC Basic is structured in its own right. You can write very good programs with BBC Basic. Pascal, which is what Ian mentioned earlier, for structured programming from universities, is a high priest language. You need to know a lot more about programming to start with it. Thank you, Henry. Um, we have another call, Mr. Hanfield, on line two. Hello, Mr. Hanfield. Good morning. Good morning. What's your question? I have a 32K micro and a cassette recorder and a monitor. Could you explain some of the expansion add-ons that I can add on to my own system? What sort of micro is it? It's a BBC B model. John? Well, I think, Mr Hanfield, it depends really what you're planning to do with the machine. The, the two obvious additions are a printer and some floppy disks. And the printer is really quite vital. It enables you to list programs, to get out letters that you've written and things like that. And that's probably going to be your first edition. Uh, but the floppy disks are useful because they give you instant access or high-speed access to a lot of information, a lot of data. So I'd go for one of those two. Thank you, John. Anybody, anything to add to that? I think that's pretty good advice. We have another caller, Mr Raj Patel on line three. Mr Patel, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is, why is... A 16-bit micro different from an 8-bit micro? Um, one could say it's got eight more bits, uh, which is exactly equivalent to one dollar, but that's not really the true answer. Um, yeah. John, would you like to have a go at that? Well, all right. There, there, it's a very difficult question to answer briefly, um, I'm afraid. In fundamental difference is that you can address a great deal more memory with a 16-bit machine, which means you can run larger programs and store more data actually in the machine. And the other uh, simple difference is that you can deal with larger numbers immediately and rather with more complex instructions immediately. So you end up with a machine which is, as we'd say in, in jargon, a lot more powerful, but you can do a lot more complex things with it. If you're just doing the sort of things like playing games and writing letters and things like that, then an 8-bit machine will be fine. But if you want to do some really good number crunching, working with big numbers, then a 16-bit machine becomes a lot more useful. It needn't necessarily be faster. Mr Patel, what's the reason for your question? Well, uh, <coughs> we have these new micros uh, coming out of the micro, uh, on, the, on the market that are 16 bits and all this will about, about them. So I was just wondering how are they better than the 8-bit micros? Well, I think it's certainly true that most of the professional software, the good professional software today, is really being written for 16-bit machines. Um, uh, we've run out of the limits of what can be done on a micro. But they needn't necessarily be any faster, need they? Right. We have another call on line four, Andrew McDermott. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning. What's your question? Well, well I've, I've bought seven computers over a period of nine months, and they've all developed various problems. And what I'd like to know is, is it something to do with me or perhaps a house, or is it just <laughs> to have a run of bad luck? <laughs> <laughs> what sort of problems have you had, Mr McDermott? Um, the, the first two had, one of 
wouldn't want keyboard troubles, neither one wouldn't save programs. Neither sort have various problems, loss of colour, uh, loss of picture and uh, not saving properly and things like that. Well, Malcolm Pelter's a journalist, I'm sure he's got a lot of experience of this. Malcolm. Yes, I think, and I'd like to go back to an earlier question about basic. There's a lot of rubbish spoken about the so-called high priests. Uh, the people who are for good professional software, good professional products, are the commercial industry, not so much the high priests in universities. It's all very well writing in basic or writing little games and writing for home use. Generally, you'll find in the computer business machines don't always do what they're supposed to do. You need a lot of professional support. And I'd recommend anyone, before they go out and buy something and spend a lot of money, to be very, very careful. These machines aren't as wonderful, aren't as all perfect as they sometimes made to be seen. Has anybody else in the audience had problems with machines breaking down or not doing what they thought they were going to do? They're all perfectly happy with it. Oh, yes, there we have one. I'd be inclined to say that most people did at the beginning and this was partly, as with any new product, you're going to have teething problems. But um, seeing micros now going into schools, my impression is that the schools that are getting micros now, they're getting good ones, whereas maybe a year ago, 18 months ago, perhaps they didn't have a chance of getting one that worked perfectly first time. And I think we're coming through the teething troubles. Thank you. Mac, um, could I just add to that? Uh, also, from the software angle, um, the same thing applies. There's an awful lot of rubbish in software and I hope people as well will complain and, and make it known if there is rubbish software so that we can get uh, uh, an awful lot of bad software out of the way and, and raise the level of software writing. Yes, I, I think one's got to be very clear as to whether you've got a, a software problem or a hardware problem. You might, you might have bought... I didn't have log enough to buy any software. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. McDowell. We have another caller on uh, line one, Glenn Deaton. Is it, is it Mr. Deaton? Yes. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Yes. Could you tell me why do some micros do not work on some makes of television? John, could you answer that? Mm. Why don't some micros work on some makes of television? All right. Um, well, the trouble is that some micros that are sold on the UK market are actually designed to work on the American television standard. And uh, a few televisions, if you hit them with the, the British television signal, uh, sorry, with the American television signal, they'll try that again. Some televisions supplied with an American signal will actually manage to produce a picture, just. And others, reasonably enough, will refuse. And that's quite likely to be the problem. There is also a problem with some micros in the production of the colour. And some televisions, particularly Sony, are much more fussy about the adjustment of the the colour components of the picture and quite reasonably they, they expect the frequency to be right and if it isn't quite right on the micro you may have troubles but quite often it can be adjusted but there are some British micros that simply produce the wrong signal. We have another call from Mr Richard Granger on line three. Good morning. Good morning. What's your question? I'd like to ask you um, which is the best micro to buy? <laughs> <laughs> How much money have you got to spend? You don't sound as if you're very... How old are you, Richard? Nine. Nine, so you've obviously got a lot of money to spend. Yes. Oh! <laughs> how much do you consider to be a lot of money? £200. £200. Uh, what's the best... I don't think there's an answer to that question, but... Uh, uh, Richard, let's go to Richard, because he's had a lot of experience buying micros for school. Richard, what is the best micro to buy? Oh, dear, the, there's so many micros that are still around that price range, and I certainly wouldn't come down on any one in particular. I think you want to think out very carefully, Richard, exactly what you want to do with the micro, and then look at the sort of software that's available for you. Look at the, uh, the, what's available for that particular make, and if that's the sort of activity that you want to do, go for that micro at the moment. Because what you want is programs to run and get the micro that goes with it. Have you got a micro already, Richard? No then I'd recommend you buy a nice cheap one so that uh, you can experiment with it, find out what you're going to use it for, and it'll enable you to judge which is the micro you should be buying as a more serious venture. Well, thank you very much, Richard, for calling. We'll be taking more calls later, and we'll be particularly concentrating on questions about software. So do ring on 01811 I'd like to thank you all for the letters. We base some of the items in this show on the things you found most interesting. And we've prepared an information sheet here on the new things we'll be showing today. And if you'd like one, you could write to the address at the end of the programme. Well, one of the most popular items you wrote to us about was the music programme. Here's a typical letter. 
It's from uh, Peter Burt um, in Kent. As a keen musician in my spare time, I was interested in the musical item. What a pity there is no electrical connection for sound from a BBC Micro. Not even an audio line. Never mind a synthesizer interface. Well, we do have an answer to that. Over to you, John. Thank you, Mac. Well, yes, indeed, we have an answer, and David, I think we'll deal with that in a moment. First of all, David, David Ellis, who's with us on earlier programmes, explain to me what the equipment is you've got here and what yeah. you can do with it. Okay, do. Well, John, I'll start off with this. Okay, well, apart from the sounds coming from the BBC Micro, all the other sounds are actually coming from the Apple computer. And the way we put those sounds into it was by using a technique called sound sampling with a microphone. So you hold the microphone under a drum and bang it, and then you store the sound, converting it into data into, into the computer's memory. And the great thing about it is you can really manipulate sounds in amazingly inventive ways. I've got here a sound which is obviously human. <coughs> And I've got yes. the sound here, which is obviously rather inhuman. <laughs> That's actually the, the um, stabbing string sound in the shower scene of Psycho. And then we've got something like this, which is a nice resonant thumb. Well, would you like to give us a sound then? OK. Hi. Hi, 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 hi. OK, that's your high. And we can then change the pitch of that. Uh, let's make it go a bit slower. And we can also reverse it. So you can have great fun with this sort of thing, but also you can take the sounds that you've sampled into the computer. And incidentally, this is a technique, sound digitization, which is used in these wonderful new compact digital discs. Um, but you can take sounds, and then you can combine them with other sounds in interesting rhythmic patterns. So for instance, I've got here a rock drum pattern, which sounds pretty impressive. Good solid stuff, that. And here I've got a, actually a rumba, with your high in it. <laughs> and various other things as well. Yes. <laughs> All so, right. Well, that's excellent. Fine. What can we do with a keyboard? Obviously, well, it'd be nice to take the keyboard and then play it with those sounds and play a tune. Um, the moment you can't do that, though, as they say, it's being worked on. What you can do is interface a keyboard like this, which is just a dummy keyboard. It only produces data, not sound. Right. That goes into the micro. And then with some additional hardware, it will produce sound. So, for instance, you can play something like this. That's really nice. And what would be really great is if you could then use that keyboard with those sounds and then play bark with a bark. Yes, right. <laughs> what can we do on the BBC micro, though? Well, of course, you're faced with a problem that as far as actually um, inputting the musical notes themselves, you don't have a musical keyboard, you have a QWERTY keyboard. Mm -hmm. And there are various ways you can use a QWERTY keyboard to put in the notes. Can you play something for us? Yeah, certainly. Right, now, David, I noticed that the quality of that is a lot better than just from the BBC Micro loudspeaker. How have we achieved that? Absolutely right. Well, what we've done is we've attached so a couple of leads to a point on the printer circuit board inside, which gives you a direct output from the sound chip. Now, there's instructions on this on the information sheet, so I won't actually explain how you do it now. Right, that's something people could go to their local dealer and get it's them to do it. It'd be much out, better to get somebody else to do it rather than actually soldering it yourself. Okay, you might fine. Right, sorry, what were you going to show us? Yeah, well, the other thing you can do is actually add on what's called a special effects box. It's a foot pedal, which adds, in this case, delay or echo. It makes a big difference. This is the raw sound. We add in the delay. Yeah. You can always imagine you're in a sort of cathedral. It's yeah. a great effect. How and much does that cost? Well, about forty pounds. You know, they make a big difference. They're worthwhile investing in. Right. Well, okay. What about other ways of actually playing notes? Well, we can use rules, and this is a program called Musical Simon, which generates tunes according to rules. It presents you with a note, and you have to play that note. Mm -hmm. And it's using the rules to generate the next note in line and you have to follow it. So it just played, I see, it played three notes. That's right. And you play it back. And it right. plays it in a particular key. Mm -hmm. So the point is it does actually have some value as a musical teaching aid, even though as far as the rules are concerned, it's amazingly basic. I mean, no, no musician's going to be fooled by what this is generating. Mm. Yes, OK. Um, we can also use these rules in a different sort of context, and that's to actually generate sound effects. Mm -hmm. What you're actually doing is taking chance procedures, you know, where you're throwing dice, and you're diluting it. You're saying don't be quite a perfect dice, you know, make it slightly weighted towards one end rather than the other. And we can do this to produce this sort of sound effect. 
Oh. Sea and gulls and everything. Absolutely right. Can we look at the listing on that? Yeah, sure, certainly. Well, it's a nice short programme, and we've got, first of all, two envelopes, to which actually set up the sounds themselves. We've got two sounds. We've got the gull sound, which is a sort of tweeting sound. Then we've got the surf, the s effect. Then we've got a repeat loop, which first of all sets up the, so the, sur the sound of the surf itself. <laughs> and we have two flavours of sound, again using random numbers. Mm. Um, then we have a gap between one surf sound and another, again, which is partially random, to create the effect of nature not being totally obvious mm. and, and predictable. Mm. Then we go off and run our procedure called Tweet. And Tweet just, first of all, sets up the size of the flock from one to three gulls and then actually produces the tweet itself. Mm, that's smart. Well, if anybody watching wants a copy of that listing, it is available on one of the information sheets. In yes, fact. that's right. Good. Can you play it again? Yes, yeah, certainly. Can I interrupt you for a moment and mm. just ask how you first got interested in computing? Uh, mostly on account of people coming on stage and saying, uh, I'm a computer programmer, you know, when I was doing my act. And I thought, crikey, the whole world is going computer mad. And I was reading about them in papers. I'd best find out about them. So for 18 months or so, I bought every magazine there was on the market, because that was my principle on everything. If I want to buy hi-fi, I buy every hi-fi mag. If I want to buy cameras, I buy every camera mag. I find out what is happening in the camera world, then I buy a camera that suits me. So for 18 months, I read every computer magazine, and at the end of 18 months, I thought to myself, well, it's a foreign language, it's all gobbledygook. I don't think at that stage there was a magazine on the market that was writing for people who, who wanted to know about computers. They were all writing for people who already knew. So I literally walked into a shop one day, uh, it was on Guernsey, and I said, um, look, I've had it, I can't understand it, there's a thousand pounds, give me a computer and I'll take it home and I'll... Maybe I'll take it apart, but I'll find out what it's all about, this, this, this uh, computer world. So I, uh, I think I was lucky. I really was. I, I own an Atari 800. Because the massive problem with all of this is that it's not written for ordinary people, and it's a shame. I think they miss out on massive marketing. Not just Atari. I'm talking about BBC. I'm talking about any of them, any of the popular makes. The, mag the magazines and the manuals are completely non-understandable. It's gobbledygook. To be honest with you, the best book that I found on, uh, on the whole business was yours, which is, breaks my heart to have to tell you. It was 30 Hour Basic by the BBC, which became my sort of manual, much more so than the Atari books. I read this and it was written simply. And it's not just for your computer, of course, which is a big advantage. So, as I say, I don't understand why they write them in all the weird language. You do much programming. It is fun to do that. And I also found that a, a nice, easy way to learn was to, in fact, um, get a magazine. There are several magazines particularly for this, just as there are magazines particularly for the BBC computer and for Sinclair computer, all those of their own house magazines, almost. And what I found was the best way was to type the first line of the program and then type run, which makes the machine work. If you, if you haven't got a computer, it makes it work. And see what happened on the screen. Because the other thing that people don't realise is you can't break them. <laughs> I mean, people are scared of them. They think, oh, what happens if I short it out or something? And you can't. The worst you can do is wipe out its memory that you've typed in. No big deal there, unless you're on line 1,655,000. But uh, then I'd type the next line and see what happened then, and then I'd type the next line. And then I learned what the commands meant. That was the best way for me to learn. What do you see yourself doing in the future? Well, I think I'll probably stay with this. I, will, I want to get more interested in, in making it activate other things around the house. Um, and although that'll be my real house. This is sort of a summer place. And I said that in the I.O. magazine, which is an Atari thing, and a, a chap called Ken Frampton was very kind to me and sent me this. 
which is, uh, I mean, when you look at it in terms of what it does, isn't a very long program at all. But that um, activates all the, the, the little plugs on the back of the interface. So that's half gobbledygook and half simple language. And it's a burglar alarm system, and it's got my own code to activate it and set it up. And then anybody standing on pressure pads around the house um, sets, you can set, switch lights on, it'll activate a videotape player to make it say, you know, what the hell are you doing here, uh, and frighten him. Uh, so that's, that's exciting, and, and I want to play more with that. I've also written an adventure game, which, well, it's a bit more than that, actually. It's, it's called Paul Daniel's Magic Adventure, and it'll be on the market, hopefully, by this Christmas. Would it be possible for us to see a bit of the game? You want, what, to see a bit of the adventure? No, it's top secret. <laughs> the lies getting very competitive when magicians start writing software. You never know what's going to happen. I love the idea of reading micro-magazines for 18 months. There are over 100 of them around, and some of them are five or 600 pages thick. But Paul's absolutely right about the jargon. There's a nice definition of jargon in Chambers 1862 Dictionary. It says, jargonizing is a phenomenon observed chiefly in acute mania. It consists in the utterance of uncouth and unintelligible sounds which may resemble harsh ejaculations and bellowings. Well, everybody loves a little bit of jargon, and uh, Stephen Castell, who's with us here in the audience today, has written a book called Computer Bluff, which enables you to weave your way through some of the computer jargon. Stephen, what's the most incomprehensible jargon you've come across? Well, good morning, Mac. Uh, good morning. Yes, well, as a, as a consultant in, uh, in information technology, I, I come across um, a lot of uh, companies and projects in computers, communications, and the management and financing thereof. And so one is in, uh, constantly encountering both uh, computer jargon, telecommunications jargon, management jargon, financial jargon, legal jargon. And uh, I think we, we ought to bear in mind that jargon actually does serve a very useful purpose when specialists are gathered together. It's a very useful form of shorthand to communicate specialist to specialist. But I think the, uh, the worst example of the kind of jargon we don't want in the context we don't want it is if, for example, the BBC user manual had opened up to us something like this. Bootstrapping your OS 1.2 causes a fetch process store cycle to execute with your ROM, resulting in a user-friendly prompt on the VDU man-machine interface. <laughs> That's bad jargon in bad context, because all it simply means is when you switch it on, you get a welcome message on the TV screen. <laughs> I always remember I was once went to have demonstrated a very large mainframe computer and uh, the, the guy was playing around with it and a few lights were flashing but he wasn't doing a hell of a lot and I said, uh, what's happening now? And he said, it's operating in a mode of non-functionality. I said, what does that mean? He says, it means it's broken down. <laughs> I, I quite enjoy jargon, and last Friday there's a jargon factory and stuff comes screaming out from the jargon factory and I came across a wonderful new piece of jargon which only uh, occurred last Friday, it's called a uh, WYSIWYG and WYSIWYG is, is very important and it concerns programs which can't be changed when you get them and it concerns documentation or screen things which can't be changed, something and what it means is what you see is what you get and you know, kind of way this program is WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get and you can't change it. I thought that uh, when you first mentioned WYSIWYG, perhaps it was a, a microprocessor-controlled hairpiece, in which case I'd, I'd really like to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other nasty piece of jargon is w w pieces which are, like you say in your book here, a piece of pure bluff, like ease of use. That's a pure piece of jargon, and what ease of use means, and I'll reveal it for the first time, ease of use means very hard to use. And what, what, so you say, well, how can it be that ease of use means very hard to use? Well, it's very straightforward. Computers, mainframe computers, used to be extremely hard to use. Now, after 20 years of experimenting and writing a lot of software, they came up with micros which were easier to use. But they weren't easier to use. They were very hard to use as opposed to being extremely hard to use. So they said, well, we're not going to sell them if we say to everybody they're very hard to use. So we say they're easy to use, which is nonsense, of course. And the next phase is going to be that computers are going to be hard to use. And that means easy to use and ease of use. So it goes on. <laughs> it's just really a lie. But a lot of this ease of use really concerns software. And in an educational environment, software has to be easy to use, especially by children. And Richard Fothergill is the director of the Microelectronics <laughs> Education Program. Richard, ease of use is really quite important in educational programs, isn't it? Absolutely essential, Mac, I think, because teachers and children want to be able to get into the program and actually work with it as quickly and easily as possible. So go do away with these complicated controls and get right into it as simply as easily as you can. 
Let me just illustrate some of the thoughts with uh, just two or three programs and extracts from them in practice. Uh, this first one is about teaching children the idea of scales on maps. Uh, the idea, if looking at it, is notice that there's very little <coughs> capital letters on it. So many instructions are given in big bold capitals or flashing letters, and this is clear and easy to read. Plenty of spaces between the words and also separations between the lines. And a very good use of colour too, simple basic colours, so that it points out what it's trying to do. And the control is just a space bar, a very simple control which anybody can appreciate. Now we move on to an animation, a, a graph there of a map, and again the colour is very simply used, reds, blues, whites. Uh, the control again is just a space bar, and not too much clutter in the graphic notice. I think that's very important. Do you think colour is worth the extra expense and ease of use? Very much indeed, because you can point out so much with colour. Uh, you can highlight various features that you want the child to concentrate on, and uh, this is a very useful technique. Move on then to the next stage, and you notice that there's just four commands, four controls figured by letters there. Let's just use one of them, and you'll see it nicely animating. Animation there just to show the idea of a scale change from one to the other. It's very obvious what this new particular graphic is now showing, the slight reduction in the scale. Another one is just to compare them. And it, this particular program runs four different scales for you to look at. Again, the control is just a space bar. Now, the nice thing about this program also is that while it's a very simple teaching idea and it's a very basic idea, nevertheless, the child can get into it in an enormously number of different directions. He hasn't got to go into it in the way I've just done, come at the same points and the same ideas in different directions. And that's very useful indeed. But that's just a tutorial program that we've just tried to uh, learn the idea of scales. Mac, in the uh, year of America's Cups, which we just completed and all addicted to, let's try a yacht race between you and I. Now, this is a reinforcement exercise. Imagine that you've been uh, learning for the last week, or perhaps only it take you a few minutes to learn where north, south, east and west are, in other words, compass points. And let's just have a look together at this particular race. The idea is just that we practice the concepts we've learnt and the, of direction and also we get a, an idea of approximation because in the middle of the picture you can see a scale which we work on. Now I'll take Liberty, which was the red boat if you remember, and I'll go southeast, uh, say four places. Oh, bang. Well, you see why Liberty lost, don't you, Mac? What will you do as victory too? Which way is the wind blowing? Uh, I think northerly. Do you remember which your compass points are? That'll help you. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> right. What about east, south, east, ten points? Right, east, south, east it is. Ten. Oh, you're getting very close to the bank, mate. No, they're calling in there for a few tubes of Foster's Lager on the way, just to show how triumphant they are. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> obvious that that's why Australia won, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. You mean the lager? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, that, that's a, just a simple demonstration of a reinforcement programme. And after you've done a tutorial exercise, and we need lots of programmes, of simple, basic tutorial programmes like that at the beginning, and then reinforcement programmes uh, like that yacht race, then we next move on to exploratory software, in which the children are exploring information and knowledge. For instance, information retrieval packages, uh, using, for instance, Logo. And the, don't forget, Logo is more than just turtle graphics and playing with that lovely toy on the floor. It's a, it's a programming language, and it goes into words and the use of words as well. Uh, and, of course, simulations. Well, simulations are an early form of exploration. And I wonder if we could just look at this program to give an idea of what a simulation is. Uh, now, in this particular one, the idea is to see how plants grow. Are they successful in growth in the condition that you're offering them? And these are representative plants, tatty wort, and this next one we'll look at perhaps is drowsy nightshade, which seems an appropriate one. Notice the clarity of the lettering here, and also the simplicity of the controls, spacebar and return key, and that's all we're using. So we've chosen that particular plant. I think we'll change the month because it seems a bit of a long time from January. Let's make it March when it runs and it starts growing from. Well, drowsy nightshade does quite well in woods. No, I think if you're out in the woods, unless you've got a body of elves going travelling down, the amount of chance of it being watered is pretty infrequent except from rainfall. So let's change it to rainfall. And there's no likely to be any fertiliser. 
I think that's a canny idea, talking to your plant. Maybe it has an effect, we don't know. <laughs> and uh, because this is micro live, we'll call it live. The idea now is to look at what that does to the plant, those conditions we've programmed in. And so just let's have a look at the changes. Now, on the right there, the time and the date and the temperatures are changing. And on the left-hand side here, the plant is beginning to grow. In the middle of the screen, and this is a nice layout, we've got the um, measuring rod to see how high it is growing. And notice the use of colour again, if you can. Green for the title of what we're looking at, and the red for the, the actual event. And any time you could stop it, stop the programme, and then let it carry on. And we've triumphed. That was a good set of conditions. The plant has grown, the plant has flowered. And that, remember that we had a lot of variables in that programme, several places where the plant could grow, several conditions of watering, several conditions of fertiliser. And the child explores each of those combinations, can stop and start and look at the graphs of the various developments of water and rainfall and temperature, and compare lots of conditions in order to get a deeper understanding of what growth is about. So this is a real exploratory program. Are these programs in use in schools? They've just come out, just released in this last fortnight, Mac. Uh, but, um, roughly how much do they cost? About £10, £10, £12 or just under, around that sort of figure, from commercial publishers. I must say it would be rather nice to think that they would actually grow real plants and show them love and affection rather than all these damned evil things coming out of a computer, wouldn't it? I suppose it's not exclusive. No, of course it's not <laughs> exclusive, but what you hope is that when you actually caress your new real plant, you've learned exactly what caresses to give it based on this programme. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've just joined us, you're watching Making the Most of the Micro Live. If you have any questions on software, we'll be taking calls very shortly. Phone now on 01811-8055. Well, in the last programme of Making the Most of the Micro, we transmitted a short computer programme as audio tones. All it did was put a message on the screen inviting people to write in with questions to the show. A rather cunning piece of promotion. Well, over 300 people wrote in as a result of that message, including one techie of nine years old who managed to list it on his Atom computer, whatever that is. And some of those people are with us here today. The largest number of letters we received asked why we couldn't transmit software over the radio. And this is a fairly typical one here. It's from Bob Sampson in West Sussex. Would the BBC consider broadcasting software on the VHF wavelengths after close-down? This would have the advantage of not needing expensive extra hardware to download from television. Now, some radio stations are already doing that, and we went to look at one, Radio West in Bristol. Welcome back to Datarama, and we're looking at one or two letters now. This one comes in from Cambridge, of all places. Someone who's written into the competition says, My computer tells me that the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 81. Or, if you don't use all capital letters, 54. What have you got, General? Well, I always thought it was 42, but uh, an answer for the ZX81 competition floppy disk from Gareth Jones of Abergavenny, and he says that uh, all our programmes load first time, which is good to hear. Well, see what you make of this one. This is this week's competition. Up to now, they've been mainly fairly simple programmes because, of course, during a radio show, you don't want to have five minutes of screeching because it will turn people off. So, of course, we have to keep them fairly short and this limits the complexity of the programmes we can put out. But we have managed to squeeze rather interesting programmes out of 30-second uh, data bursts. Um, we tend to put out uh, competitions uh, in which the listener has to uh, decode certain things within the, uh, the, the competition. For example, it might be a programme which won't run until they've done something to the programme. Once they've done that, uh, taking out line 20 or whatever it is, and then the programme runs, they are a rev the, the answer is revealed to them, and they then have to send that in to us as a competition entry. We've also put out s short games, um, things for lining up your television set and so on. Uh, and also, the first, the first one we put out was a picture of a girl. This is supposed to be Cheryl Land, doesn't really look anything like her. But um, we put that out uh, coded for various micros and, and we got these printouts back from people who said, you know, it works, great, congratulations. Are there any problems with it? Surprisingly, when we did our first tests on this months and months ago, we found that it loaded first time off medium wave, which is, you probably uh, realise has got a very, very limited bandwidth and there's all sorts of interference and so on at night. We did our test at about two in the morning and even with the foreign stations beaming in on the same frequency, we still had no problems loading.
Well, a couple of weeks ago, the BBC launched a new service on CFAX to provide free computer software. The manager of this service is Lawson Brown. Tell us about it, Lawson. Telesoftware, as far as the BBC is concerned, is involved with transmitting computer programs and data using the ordinary television signal and CFAX pages. Here we have an ordinary television set, and we can flick through the channels. And the picture's been adjusted so that we can see an area of screen that we don't normally see with our ordinary uh, pictures that we watch. There are four lines of dots going across the top of that screen, and that's digital information that's transmitted. An ordinary teletext set would decode that and turn it into the CFAX pages that you can usually call up with a handset. Now, because it's digital, we can equally well feed that output into a microcomputer. And to do that, we need an adapter of some description to take the information and put it into memory. We just unplug the aerial from the television set itself, plug the output from the microcomputer into it, and the aerial lead into the adapter. Select the appropriate channel and tell the computer we're going to use teletext. So this adapter would actually convert a perfectly ordinary television set, not a teletext set, into a, a teletext set? No, it will even convert, um, it will convert an ordinary set and it will also convert an ordinary monitor. Ah. You don't have to have a teletext set at all. Nice. Now, the simplest How much does it cost? It's uh, just over £200. The simplest way to use the unit is as an ordinary teletext receiver. Very expensive one, of course, but, and we can call up the ordinary CFAX or any other teletext page that's being transmitted by any other broadcast company. The exciting thing we can do with it, of course, though, is to download software. And to do that, we call up the page number on which I know there's a program. If you don't know which programs are being transmitted, you can look up the index on page 701 of CFAX. And as CFAX cycles, the page will be picked up and that program will be downloaded into the memory of the microcomputer. It's, it's going through really like a carousel, as you like. It, yes, it, it is. It, it's very much like a, a carousel slide projector, the way uh, CFAX is transmitted. We must have dropped in at rather a wrong point. It's taking Yes, it's coming it down now. We can get about 1K of software for technical people that are watching onto a single frame. Mm -hmm. And because we're limited by CFAX access time, then that downloading time is about 12 and a half seconds for each frame. Mm -hmm. You can get a big program down in five minutes. And what sort of programs are you sending down? A very wide range of programs. In the initial stages, a lot of the software is going to be educational. Mm -hmm. We're getting support for the service from Microelectronics Program and from Brighton Polytechnic Faculty of Education who are carrying out an experiment. And we're particularly interested in the sort of software that is not available by other means. One of the advantages of this system is that it does allow access to ordinary CFAX data. So we can actually grab the information that's put onto CFAX pages and process them by simple programs. It's that loaded pro now, can we that's run right, it? That program's downloaded, and if we just run it, we should see a simple program to demonstrate how we can actually do that. It's all on time delay, so. That's taken the Financial Times Index, Friday's close from a CFAX page. It's now waiting for today's recipe to appear. So that's kind of like a menu program that's going into various other pages of CFAX, pulling in the data and assembling it so you can actually see that's it. That's exactly right, and it is very simple. That's accessed from within an ordinary basic program. No need for machine code or assembly or anything like that. Clearly, you wouldn't be able to do that sending a program down on the radio. But let's go back to Mr. Sampson's question. Why do you transmit programs on radio as well as sending it out on CFAX? Because the sort of service we wanted is far more sophisticated than what was possible over the radio system. As was said by, Mr. S uh, by the film interview, they are limited to fairly short pieces of software for obvious reasons, the noise and so on. One of the important factors that this adapter gives us as well over radio is error checking. And every page that's downloaded is error checked as it comes down. That means that you never download a program with a bug in it. So that if, if it was sent over the radio, you could actually receive it and then run it, and you wouldn't know whether there was a bug in the program or there was a bug in the transmission of the data. That's right. If you get a bug now, it's a bug in the program. It's not a bug in transmission. That's guaranteed. It still seems a lot of money. I, I still quite, can't quite see why people shouldn't take the advantage of uh, having it on an ordinary receiver. 
Couldn't you do it as well? Certainly as far um, with the radio transmissions, there are transmissions going on with short pieces of software and that's being done for educational broadcasts and so on. But this service is completely based on the whole approach to the system rather than single small programmes. Is it only for the BBC Micro at the moment? At the moment it is. The Micro is the only unit that has a teletext adapter available for it. But technically we can transmit software in any language or for any machine. So you would do that, would you, um, when other machines had adapters? This would be up to the manufacturer to come along and talk to us and say that uh, he was providing this service and he could guarantee a reasonable audience and obviously some sort of software support. We would then discuss fairly closely whether we could offer him transmissions for his machine. I'm a bit worried about uh, free software. I always think that something you get for nothing is pr worth precisely what you pay for it. Also, it could deter people from actually making an investment to really write first-class software and block it. Who's actually paying for this free software? Is it me as a license holder? No, it isn't. The software that we're having produced to go with particularly our broadcast series is being commissioned by the television service. Of course, the adapter and so on does provide an income anyway. Um, we're also producing a kind of software that's not normally available, so we don't see ourselves in direct competition with the ordinary software market. We can, of course, provide a software maintenance and data service for the market that's never been available to any other publisher. I see. Well, thank you very much, Lawson. Um, I think we've been so fortunate so far in that not one micro has broken down and uh, nothing has um, gone wrong so far, except my attention has been drawn our clock stopped, <laughs> which just shows what happens when you use low technology. Well, it's time for another phone-in. We've got uh, a caller on line one, Anthony Attack. Hello, Anthony. Hello. Good morning. What's your question? Uh, is it possible for a programmer to safeguard his software from pirates? And if so, how? Well, I'm sure that's right in Ian Trackman's court, because Ian Trackman's written a lot of uh, programs for sale, including all the stuff that came out on the last series on making the most of the micro. Ian, how do you safeguard your programs from being stolen, or is that itself a trade secret? Um, well, yes, of course. It, it, um, if I try and answer that over the air, um, there's going to be all our viewers are going to know uh, exactly how to break that protection. Protection is a very difficult problem um, because programs uh, are in the computer and once they're in there um, you can get at them. Really the, the only uh, solution that's been, complete solution that's been found is some kind of hardware attachment uh, that you have to fit to your computer. The computer recognizes the hardware and then will run the program. Um, there are of course lots of, uh, of little tricks that you can do. Um, if I put down the phone, um, let me show you a, a little trick or two that, that we can do. Um, and I'll write a little program here. Um, repeat, um, print, uh, X, O, X. All I'm making it do is just print some, something on the screen. Um, and I'll list this out there. And all I'm going to do is just make it print some numbers. Now, it's just printing away there. If I press Escape, we can get to the program. Now, actually, what I can do is mess about with the program itself. I'll put a line in at the beginning, on error, go to 40. That means when I now press escape, it's going to go to a new line 40. And I'm going to put a line in 40, um, which is a, a real bit of computer um, jargon. Um, but what I'm doing is actually corrupting the program. So I'll show you the program again. Uh, and if we now run it with any luck, if I now press escape and I try and list the program, yes indeed it's come back bad program and uh, it's going to be very difficult for anybody to get that program back again. Thank you very much Ian. We have another caller on line two, Mr Hudson, good morning. Good morning. Could you tell me exactly what machine code is and what the average user wants it for? John, would you like to tackle that? Oh boy, um, yes, it's not easy to explain what machine code is, to say the least. Um, machine code is a, a technique which enables you to write programs which are fast, much faster than when written in basic or another language, and small. So if you want to write a program that must occupy very little memory, machine code's attractive, but it is difficult to write in. You're writing in a, in a language, we'd say, which is much nearer the language that the micro processor itself understands and it's not anything like the language that human beings understand and you've got this choice you can either uh, write in something that's very easy to write which is often 
uh, a bit slow when it's running, or go the other way and try and get near the uh, computer's language. Now, there are routes which will take you down to machine code whilst writing in an easy language. But machine code's the difficult language that the computer itself understands. I think someone from our audience wanted to, the lady in the spotted dress. Um, with regard to the CFAX programs that can be downloaded, what is the position regarding copyright? Did you hear that, Lawson? What's the position regarding copyright on the CFAX programs? Copyright on transmitted software is virtually identical to the rules that are applied as far as videotaping programs are concerned. So if you read the, if you're from school, a uh, school, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's um, private. There is a copyright notice sent out and the restrictions are virtually identical. Basically you can copy them and record them for your own and modify them for your own purposes. We have another caller on line three, Shirley Phillips. Hello Shirley, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my question is about uh, word processing courses. My company just bought me a word processor and the courses that are being offered range from anything from £200 a day or um, £100 a day and um, it's, or, or just the morning for, for £100. Now, to learn all that there is to know when you haven't been exposed like myself to this sort of thing before seems, my God, how am I going to learn that all in a morning? Um, and are there any evening classes or cheaper ways of learning? Or <laughs> that one can you see, I'm not, if I was 16, it would, I could learn most probably at a faster rate, but I, I'm no longer 16, and my learning capacity is obviously <laughs> slightly slower than that. Well, our business consultant is Colin Harris. Colin, have you any comments to make? Well, word processing is uh, perhaps the most important aspect of using a micro in business terms. Most people use a micro for word processing. They use it for other things as well. In terms of learning, it depends very much on whether the manufacturer of either the hardware or the software runs their own courses. The most popular packages available uh, for the business computers uh, don't have courses run for them by manufacturers of either. There are a number of companies, there are a number of dealers, there are a number of evening polytechnics, etc., that run word processing courses, but they're all in specific subjects. They all are running particular packages on particular machines. And I think the lady needs to be a bit more specific about what package and what machine she wants to use before looking at what courses are available. I'd agree entirely that in half a day, it's very difficult to learn one of the complex packages that are available. Has anybody else got any experience? Yes. I'm, <clears throat> I'm appalled that the caller's employer hasn't provided some training. And I think it's a question in the use of office automation. I think there's an obligation on the employer to provide sufficient training. Uh, and I wonder what the employer's doing. There are, when the question of word processing, there's the immediate thing of operating the piece of equipment, but there's also an understanding of what it can do in the whole of, of the office. And as well as there's an appalling lack of training often of operators, but of managers, and the many cases where what goes wrong with word processing is managers who don't understand how to provide the documentation and deal with the word processing output. We are doing a new series on the electronic office or the office of the future and that's coming out in February and uh, there'll be a whole programme there on word processing which will at least set the scene so I hope that will help you a little bit. That was almost introducing a plug for a wonderful new series. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, we have another call on line four, Neville Tynemouth. Good morning, Neville. Good morning. What's your question? Well, my friend and I have written some simple games for the Vic computer and we wonder if we should try and sell them commercially or wait until we are older and more experienced. Ian, you're used to selling software, or Richard, perhaps uh, he might want to sell these into school. He didn't say what sort. What sort of programs are they? They're just uh, simple games, really. Simple games. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that you want to approach Commodore because they're the sort of people who would market uh, software for themselves or a small local publisher. But I'd have thought in the first instance, a good idea to try it on uh, some local experience computer operators, like a local computer club near where you live and get their experience about how good your programming is before you go on a bit further. You can also attempt to sell them to, to magazines, of course, but you lose the copyright if you do that, but you might make a little bit. And, of course, these things do get copied. I would try a magazine or your local club. We have another caller on line one, Robert Cockroft. Good morning, Robert. Good morning. Good morning. Can we help you? Yeah, I'm wondering what can be a statement that 
the numbers be used for anything else except music? David, did you hear that question? I think he's, I think he's really asking what else can you do with data statements apart from music, so it's really Ian's call. I think I can do that one, <laughs> Okay, Ian. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, we're talking about basic here, um, and there are two commands, read and data. Um, read tells the program to go to the data line and get some data, some information from that line. Now, you can put really anything that you want in there. If you tell it to read a word or read a number, uh, then it will read that word or read that number, and it's entirely up to you in the context of your program what you then want to do with that number or with that word or with the letters. So the answer is yes, you can do anything with data. Thank you, Ian. Well, there will be another phone-in section later where we'll be concentrating on music and graphics. When a beginner's, beginner's given a job to program, he instinctively wants to get on the machine and start coding immediately. He's so enthusiastic about it and uh, he really is anxious to write some code. But usually it's best to think the problem through and specify exactly what you want to do. Coding's really almost the last thing you want to do. The last thing, of course, is to test out whether the programs work. So let's have a look at how our programmers have tackled the job. Darlene, I've got to be careful not to call you Darling. I know it embarrasses you terribly. Darlene, how's it going? It's going pretty good. We've got our um, ads coming up on the screen fine, and now we're working on uh, so adding some graphics and pretty things coming up on the screen in between each ad. So the idea is to get the, the sort of display in between we, we, to attract we, the attention, is it? We started with the basics of the thing, the actual bits that it actually needs to do, and now we're working on doing the other embellishments to actually make it look pretty. We've only done one routine at the moment there to do a five-pointed star. Uh, we're now working on other routines that will sort of catch the eye and sort of try and make people look at it. But at the present moment, you change and you have to hit the, hit the key button. Uh, it does actually wait for 15 seconds. If, if you don't press a key in that time, it'll go on anyway. Mm -hmm. Terrific. How are you getting on? Uh, Alice News Agent Station Parade. Excellent. How have you tackled the problem? Did you, did you um, define it first or did you go straight into coding? Uh, well, it was fairly obvious that we were going to have to put letters up on the, uh, the messages up on the screen, which didn't really require much thinking about. Um, apart from what sizes you want and, and so on. So we went straight into coding that and now we're thinking about what we can do to uh, make it more attractive, put things in between the screens and so on. That's great. That's excellent. Right, let's see how you're getting on. How, Charles, how are you doing? Uh, I'm quite pleased, actually. The Spectrum doesn't have any special characters that are very large and so we've had to actually poke, do a lot of fancy peaks and pokes just to get the double height letters. Perhaps I should mention here that there's a difference in price between these machines. They're not all the same price, so they all have different facilities. This looks to be in black and white at the moment. Will you colour it up later? Well, colour's quite easy to do on a Spectrum, mm -hmm. and so uh, we can do that very quickly at the end with the, with the tributes. But uh, it's just getting the large letters, and just getting large letters on the screen is quite difficult on a Spectrum. But uh, uh, we know it can be done, so we've done it. I noticed from looking at the... Uh, papers on your desk, nobody's actually written a flowchart. Have you got firm opinions on it? I've never seen anybody actually uh, uh, who produces, who writes good programs actually use flowcharts. In fact, I don't think I've seen anybody who writes programs uh, use flowcharts. Uh, one just squiggles away and uh, I'll make something out of the squiggles, I think. You usually end up with a flowchart more difficult to actually understand than the program you've written. I, I quite agree. I quite well, agree. our programmers have just over an hour to complete their masterpieces. We'll see them again later when, with a bit of luck, they'll have finished. But real problems require first-class software, and that takes a lot of time to write, not just a couple of hours. And even smaller errors could have disastrous results in situations that really matter. <laughs> Although its headquarters is this modern office block, the University of Oxford Local Examination Board is the oldest setter and marker of examinations in the country. Each year, the completed marked exam papers from over 180,000 hopeful candidates covering 165 different syllabuses from O-level English to A-level Dutch end up here. And to sort and check all those papers each year, the board employs 400 local students. Until 1981, the procedures for handling this kind of information were virtually unchanged from the 19th century. It was a complicated, paper-based system, involving endless copying, correlating and collating. Then two years ago, at a cost of £400,000, the board installed a mainframe computer. Yeah. 
It handles all the administration. It's used for editing, storing and printing some of each year's question papers. It analyses each year's results and even sends each candidate a personalised timetable. The benefits are many, but the board still relies heavily on paper for collecting the data in the first place. Paul Humphreys is one of the board's computer managers. The computer did help enormously once we'd got the data in there because getting information out in the way that we wanted it was very easy. Simply write programs to do that and on the line printer out comes the information. One of the side effects was that we designed a new style of entry form that schools filled in and sent into the office and we collect them here. The ones you can see on the table here uh, represent nearly all of the, the um, entries for this summer's examination. You can see there's an enormous amount of paper still left in the system, although we've got a mainframe computer. At the Matthew Arnold School in Oxford, teacher Colin Relton is responsible for the school's examination entries. It means long hours after school has finished, transferring lists of names and subjects from his files to the entry forms. Until now, this information had to then be copied and typed by someone else into the board's computer. But recently, the schools have also acquired computers. With the government putting up half the money for their purchase, by 1982, virtually every secondary school in the country owned at least one micro. And that's when the exam board introduced a new way of collecting the entry information. The board posts two floppy disks to the school with specially written software that will enable the teacher to set up a database of entries using one of the school micros. One disk will be posted back to the board, the other stays at the school. The subjects are entered as numbers, as they were on the handwritten forms. But now the program automatically displays the subject name as a check. When the entry is complete, it can be saved onto the disk and the details of the next candidate entered. The school can use their copy of the disk to print lists for subject teachers, for example. And they save 25 pence per candidate in entry fees. Because the information is already in magnetic form, and back at the board, the saving in data processing costs is passed on. By taking the floppy disk that was sent from schools, we can insert it into the disk drive of the micro, run a program that was pre-prepared to say, take the data from that disk, pass it down the line into the heart of the mainframe. As far as the mainframe's concerned, it doesn't know where the data's coming from. It's just a series of electrical disturbances on the line. The fact it's been driven by the intelligent micro, as opposed to somebody sitting there manually keying it in at a dumb terminal. I think it's a very good system. I can see no real disadvantages to it at all. No school has to use the system. If they like to go on using the manual method, they can do. But uh, this, I see, has great advantages. But I see more advantages for the future. It will um, help eliminate a lot of the paperwork and a lot of organising lists. Well, they're currently sending their data on disks through the post, but it would be equally possible to connect their micros into the tele telephone network and send it direct to the mainframe computer, of course, if they've got the right kit and the right sort of software. What's the code, John? <laughs> well, Mac, to connect the telephone line to the computer, you have to use one of two things, either an acoustic coupler or a modem. This is quite a nice acoustic coupler. It enables you just to take the telephone handset and plug it in like that and in that way to get a very simple connection between the telephone and the micro. The nice part about it is, of course, it can be with a little portable micro like this. The whole thing can be portable. It's battery driven. And uh, I was using one of these in, uh, in New York when I was over there with the BBC. So I could go to a local phone, uh, put in 10 cents, dial a local number. It would get me through through a satellite into the UK, into British Telecom Gold. And I'd already typed into the micro some messages I wanted to send. I'd shoot them through. And at any time of the day or night, I could do it. And then, of course, I could read the replies as they came through. It's a nice little system. Yeah, it, it, it's very useful. Right, Let's try going in now, uh, dialing a telephone, using this modem here and getting straight in. So we dial 9 for an outside line and then 8372844 and we'll see if that will ring out. I have a nasty feeling, Mac, that we're going to have a few problems this morning. 
Um, partially because I think we're going to have an awful lot of lines busy, and I don't know whether we'll get through on this number. It's ringing. We'll see. Uh, and it's still ringing. And if a hundred other people are also trying to ring in, we may not get in on this line. <laughs> but if not, we'll go around a different way. Right. Not going to get in that way, so I'm going to have to go in, I'm afraid, through a uh, packet switch system. Um, sorry about that. 907536131. Now, would you explain what a packet switch system is and what? <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. It's just another route going through another network, and unfortunately, it's a little more difficult to go in this way. And we'd hoped we'd be able to get in the direct way, but it's another route through a national network into this London computer. I just hope fewer people are going that way. Right, that's whistling. And let's now wake up the uh, packet switch exchange, please. And Come on, reply to me. Ah, thank God for that. Right, and now it wants to know who I am. So this is the uh, code to get in here. TL, typed that wrong. Gold M. And it didn't take, because I made a typing mistake. And I do hope the cameras aren't on the keyboard too well there. Right, and it now wants to know the address of the computer that we want to get through. Well, I'll try and get to the one we were getting to. 219-201-004. That was a secret little piece of code you put in there. That, right. Uh, now, now, we are now at last through to this London computer, and that was where I was trying to get through by direct dialing. Right. British Telecom Gold, we're through. We now have to type in our identification, which we said our ID was OWL001. And the machine asks what our password is, so no cameras on the keyboard, please. The password is that. And Telecom Gold, Automated Office Services, we're through. Mail call... Ah, <laughs> computer security error. I think illegal we have access. some hackers. I think you tempted some hackers <laughs> rather too well. Uh, illegal access. I hope your television program runs as smoothly as my program worked out your passwords. Nothing is secure. Hacker song. Put Fine. another password in, <laughs> bomb it out and try again. Try to get past logging in. We're hacking, hacking, hacking. <laughs> That's brilliant. All try right. his first wife's maiden name. This is more than just a game. It's real fun, but just the same. It's <laughs> hacking, 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 yes. Yeah, well, oh, no. Now, ACN019, hi there, Alex, from Oz and Yug. Now, look, Oz and Yug, just go away, will you? We want to do a demonstration here. Go away. <laughs> um, right, now, if they've left this system anything like intact, we should be able to do a mail scan and find out who's been sending us letters. I gather they've been coming in rather fast. Um, let's just stop it there. Now, that is a list of all the letters. All or the letters, right. Uh, from Mercury Subject Micro Live, Microcomputer Course. One from Al and there, all hackers of the world unite. Yes, they've <laughs> been there as well. Um, let's just keep going down. Deaf community, David Naylor. Right, let's have a look at uh, letter number six and... Letter number seven. You can see letter number six. We read it across. It says, from D. Naylor, VCM, that's Visicom, uh, posted on Sunday the 2nd of October at 11.19, posted on System 81, that's in London, subject, deaf communication. So I'll just stop the system and we'll have a look at those letters there. That's letter five and letter six. Let's read letter five and letter six. Right. Here's the one, letter five. Further to my inquiry, deaf communication, a verbal reply on the program will on the program will be welcome oh as i have hearing family with me while watching the program regards doreen okay well let's send him a reply uh, type in reply i hope and it's not a him with a name like doreen you're <laughs> quite right well done <laughs> there's enough men in computers but there are some women who like to actually right, learn we, about we'll, computers we'll reply politely then and notice that when you want to send a reply you don't have to sort of write the envelope out you know andrew towers 56 uh, Bedford Road or whatever, you can just say reply and it knows where to send the reply to. Right, text. Um, hi, uh, Doreen. Uh, how are you uh, today? I hope you are well. How's that? Now, ah. we've got an interrupt, an expresses letter. Express letter. Well, express letters can go away. Right. Uh, somebody else has sent us a letter, express, so it comes up on the screen whether we want it or not. My spelling's not too wild. I'm just going to ask the system to check my spelling. No more expresses, please, for the moment, lads and lasses. Right, Dialcom Spelling Error Detection and Correction. It's got a 26,000-word dictionary, and it takes all the words in my letter and compares it with the dictionary. Yes, I spelt it T-O-O-D-A-Y, and, of course, computer, you're so right, I meant today. And what was my other mistake? Doreen's an unknown word. All right, well, we can add it to the dictionary. 
and there it's added to the dictionary and spells complete. Right, sign John, dot S, dot S sends it and it's sent there. Action required, we can now file it or do anything we like with it. Of course, we must emphasise that communications between deaf people is absolutely ideal using this type of system. They can read them out at their own leisure and uh, send off messages and communicate with Indeed, each other. Indeed, and also breakthrough. blind groups are working with the system. It's quite incredible, but you can get a Braille output device. Could we look at another letter? Yes, another one coming up. Uh, this... I was there. This is actually from the same chat. I was very disappointed that this programme is not subtitled. As you're aware, the electronic mailbox system with chat facilities are ideal for the deaf communication. I think there's much potential here. I'm profoundly deaf in particular. OK, I happen to have picked two out. Uh, well, one of the reasons we can't subtitle, of course, is because it's live and we can only subtitle when it's recorded. Right, right. Well, we survived that just. Um, I'm grateful for the hackers to have uh, let us at least loose on that bit. Uh, well, let's have a look at the express letter, shall we? That's, that's, well, the express letter let's live, right. live dangerously. Oh, my goodness, you do. <laughs> Mail, scan, unread, uh, express letter. Well, nobody's read this, so it hasn't been censored. And we no, might get the most extraordinary here. thing here. But right, these are all... If you're going to do something live, you've got to live dangerously. These are all the express letters that have come in. There are one or two of them. Oz has been at it again. Uh, Ronson... How about a chat? Uh, well, sorry, not today. Chat's off this morning, anyway. It'll be back on shortly. Uh, March July. Uh, microcomputer course. Should we have a look at number four? Yes. One of the express ones? OK. Uh, read number four. Yes, all right. Uh, who's that? Central Sales. No, Central Sales of ICL. You're off. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no plugs today. Right. Um, hello, my name is James. I'm eight years old. I'd like to know when the next computer course will be shown on TV. Well, that was a good one. That was true. <laughs> well, that was live and <laughs> breathe a sigh of relief. You know I, the answer to that. Um, tell us later. I don't know what sort of computer course. No, I don't honestly know the All answer right. to that. Well, we've got some others coming up, which I think we'll, we'll talk about and on. The, but this last series is going to be repeated sometime later Again. on this year. <laughs> but it's not a new All one. All right. There will be a new series, a couple of new series, one on robotics next year, one on the automated office. Um, All right. OK, Mac, well, let's uh, leave well, that there. Th thank you very much, John. Well, all this is completely legal. We're actually paying for our time on the machine. We're paying for our line time and so on. But a lot of interest being expressed in kids using their home micros, getting into the telephone network, and then breaking into a large mainframe computer and causing absolute chaos, the sort of thing we saw in that film, War Games. Well, happily, it's not quite as easy as that, but I did love the bit in Superman 3 where he got on and he said, transfer all the money into my account. If it was easy as that, we'd all be rich. There are some issues here, though, because people have got into computers. They've uh, <laughs> used them to transfer money. They've used them to create awful messes. There are several solutions. One is to stop them completely, but that's extremely difficult and inconvenient for the people who are actually using the computers themselves. Like in your house, if you have 53 bolts and locks on the door, you just get bored of it. Obviously, if you leave the door open, as they had on that uh, example there, people are going to get in. The other way is to know when they've actually broken in. Like in your house, you have your windows, you lock the doors, and if they've broken the window, you know somebody's been in there, so you can find out what they've been up to and perhaps trace who's done it. And finally, of course, you can separate the text from the, the data so that 46 is a secret number. It happens to be, well, you don't know what it is. It's not secret. It doesn't mean anything. But um, when it's ICI's next quarter's profits of 46 million, it suddenly becomes very confidential, so you can separate them. Would anybody like to chat of any personal experience on problems with computer security? John, John Vince. We had an interesting experience, Mac, a few years back on our mainframe computer. Um, we just purchased it, £700,000 worth of equipment, and uh, all was working very well until we allowed school children onto the system. And within a few weeks, um, some 14-year lad, 14-year-old um, lad broke into the system and discovered where all the passwords were kept and he thought it would be rather intriguing if he printed these out on every printer in the, within the poly. Um, it caused all sorts of problems. We had to power down the machine and write to everyone and assign them new passwords, but it was just uh, a challenge to, to the boy, really. It sounds like a very low security type of system. Some systems are very low security, but some are much higher than that. Has anybody experienced? There are rumours that people have actually broken into some quite secure computers, but they're usually employees. M Malcolm, have you written any stories about this? Well, there's quite a large amount of computer crime that goes on. No one actually knows how much because most of the time it's not reported, even when it's found, because companies don't like to reveal how insecure their systems are. And when you think of it, for example, banks 
money or, or anyone who's got money on a bank account, that money exists primarily as pulses wearing around the computer. And there have been many discovered and publicized cases of, of crimes where people just transfer money that doesn't actually exist in real form, but get the password, say money should be transferred from one bank to another. And as it only exists as those electronic pulses, that happens. There's also one of the greatest aids to the computer criminal in this way are poorly documented systems, poorly developed, because an employee, say an accountant or a clerk working in an accounts department, if a computer makes a lot of mistakes, like issues two checks uh, by mistake, suddenly it twigs, well, if it's issued two checks and no one's noticed, perhaps we could do it again. And I think it's an important case for any business that is involved in any kind of computer system to be very careful and about the documentation and the controls uh, and also the understandings of the employees about how the system works. Because there are all sorts of stories about uh, hidden bombs in computers in, in the sense that uh, as long as your name is on the payroll, everything works perfectly. But if your name disappears off the payroll, it explodes and overwrites all the data files and screws up all the controls and all the system and so on. And uh, how, how true that is, I'm a bit sceptical about it. It has to be a very naive system. I yes? Uh, yes, uh, the uh, question then about uh, documentation. And, um, and uh, it brings me back to the previous question about flow charting and whether it's necessary to flow chart a system. I'm actually an accountant and that's why I've uh, come in here but I often get involved with uh, looking at systems and testing them particularly and it seems to me unless there's a flow chart or something like a flow chart where you can check the logic of the system then it's impossible to make sure that it can't be broken into. Well, I think there is a difference between writing flowcharts for, for code, as we're doing over there, and writing them for business systems, the overall flowchart. And I think those are very important. I'm sure Colin Harris would agree with that, that they are quite important to understand the overall total system. Right, well, we've got to come out of there. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, one of the questions, one of the letters we've got um, from various people concerned our buggy, and it says, can the BBC control robots? And what uses could this have? Well, it does say that. Can the BBC control robots? And, uh, of course, as we all know, the BBC do have a lot of robots or people that behave like robots from time to time. And I believe it means, can the BBC micro control robots and what use them would have? Well, we did actually use the BBC micro to control our little buggy and uh, it found its way out of a maze eventually with a lot of prompting and it also managed to raise a flag and the genius of the BBC engineers have at last found a major use for it. And here it is delivering my coffee. My goodness, it even steers. <laughs> well, if you are interested in the use of computers in control, we're going to have a new series and uh, next year called Computers in Control and it's about robots. Well, we had several letters after the last series asking about the way we used the micro for subtitling. And here's one of them. He said in Radio Times we were going to be shown on one programme about how titles are superimposed on the screen. It said the ones we see were done on the BBC computer. You did not show this. Can something be done to explain these things? I fully realise you also use the same expensive gear. Well, there is a way to adapt the micro for this purpose, but first of all, John Coll has been upstairs to the control room to have a look at the system used by the BBC. Right, Mac. Well, now we're in the gallery of Studio 4 where the pictures are mixed before transmission. Now, to generate subtitles, you need two pictures. One's the background and the other's the caption. And if you just mix the two together in the ordinary way, you get this effect, which is all right. But as you see, you can actually see through the subtitle onto the background. Now, a much better way of doing it is to generate a black box on the background like this and then to drop the caption into that black box. But there is a problem. The television pictures are generated a line at a time, starting at the top, across that line, and then down on the next line. And if you want to mix two pictures together, you have to make sure that the two pictures are synchronous. They actually start at the top of the screen together at the same time. If you don't have them synchronous, you get this effect. Well, generating the black box is quite easy. That's done by the ordinary studio mixing equipment. But making the two pictures synchronous is rather more difficult. And we use a BBC Micro for the captions here. And there's a special board in the BBC Micro to make it synchronous with all the other pictures in the gallery here. 
Well, all that equipment cost a lot of money, but now, thanks to the ingenuity of the BBC engineers, they're getting a lot of credit at the moment, you can do subtitling at home using one of these amazing boxes with all these plugs and sockets in it. We, more information will be available if you write to the address that will be given at the end of the programme. Well, to demonstrate how it works, we need a video. And we asked our next guest, John Vince, who is the head of computer graphics at Middlesex Polytechnic, to do one for us. We'll be talking to John in a few minutes about okay. graphics. Thank you, John. It's a little portable video recorder. Yes. Now, if I can find the plug, all I have to do is plug it in. Ah, oh, here we are. Wonderful. Things. Yes. Plug it in there. And then I hit play. It's coming up to speed, and with a bit of luck, we'll see the, the graphic. There it is. That's the video you've just taken. Now, I can put... We store the program in here, and there it cuts a hole in the film and puts them recorded during Micro Live, 2nd of October 1983. Switch it off, put another one up. Ian McNaught Davis, that was subliminal. That was quick. <laughs> you know, that very quick. And what have you put on next? Would oh, you buy a used computer from this man? That's very yeah. rude and cheeky. <laughs> I'm going to have that. I should have done that as a subliminal one. <laughs> Well, John, what are you doing in computer graphics at Middlesex Poly? Well, uh, a variety of things. Um, we have to keep a tremendous range of equipment for our 7,000-odd students. Everything from, I think, about 200 different micros, um, a mini-computer for computer-aided design and computer graphic work, and a very large mainframe for general-purpose work. You've brought some stuff along to show us now, the sort of programs mm, Yes, I, I thought I'd bring along um, one of our latest acquisitions. It's, um, it's called a VIP machine. It, it's a micro, um, quite a large micro, about 400K of memory and twin processors, and it's dedicated to supporting computer graphics. And I have got four little demonstration pieces, if you'd like to see mm -hmm. them. The first one shows off how fast it can fill in, say a three-dimensional scene, the, the area in fill, and also uh, brings out the very high resolution. It's 512 lines by 512 pixels, so we've got a, a quarter of a million pixels on the screen and 16 colours out of 4,000. It's quite a fast processor, so it can manipulate 3D objects uh, in real time. And uh, that's taking out the hidden lines from that It's cube, hiding yes. the lines as well. I'll stop that. And this third sequence shows uh, this three-dimensional dodecahedron, and it's shaded, and it, it's exploding at as fast as it can. I mean, e even this machine cannot explode it in real time. It's only a micro. And the, the last sequence is just our friendly owl. Now, you've actually, some of your work you've done for, for Superman 3. Yes, uh, we were approached by a production company in London, um, I think it was late last year, who's said, would we uh, do a sequence of showing Superman spinning in space? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems we had there was to get the, the model of Superman inside the computer. And one way I approached it was to have this uh, excellent model built. Uh, it's made out of plaster. And to be able to get the coordinates of the surface into the computer, it was first sliced. Can you lift it up a little Yes, I can take out half no, of it. if you lift the whole thing If I lift up, up the up whole up model up. there... You can see the model will come out of the, the base, but we had to get every surface detail into the machine, and to do that, we cut the model into slices, and each slice was digitised uh, on a digitiser and fed into the computer. A second model was prepared, and this was cut vertically, and the two digitised files were superimposed on one another, and then the same programme that was rotating the cube you've just seen was basically used for rotating Superman. That's terrific. Well, let's have a look at that clip from the film right now. Now it's time for our next phone-in. It's... Uh on graphics or sound, or for that matter, any other subject, have Kalvinder Singh on line one. Hello, Mr. Singh. Hello. Uh, what's your question? So, um, the problem I have is that uh, the first thing is I've got a Vic 20 computer. That's a very serious problem. And uh, and the problem is that um, uh, I'd like the graphics, in other words, um, letters going from top to bottom and also from bottom to top and left to right and right to left. In other words, like Coronation Street. I'd like uh, letters or a cast flowing from top to bottom or from bottom to top. 
Is that possible on the VIC-20? Uh, we have someone there who would like to answer that yeah, in um, the audience. That is quite possible uh, to get letters scrolling. You can scroll them from the bottom of the screen using just a plain scroll routine that's built in. From scrolling from the top, you need to use the insert and delete command, um, which is one of the features of the VIC. You can also scroll the text from left to right, but I don't know about from right to left. Oh, thank you, Mr. Singh. I think what we could do is just drop you a note and give you more details on that particular one. Uh, we have, sorry, we have another caller. We're trying to get through as many calls as we can. Uh, we have another caller on line four, Mrs. Uh, Frances Williams. Uh, good morning. Where are you phoning from? From Luton. What's your question? Uh, I enjoyed Dave Ellis's bark very much, but can you tell us more about how computers can be used in music education and are there any organisations to help teachers? Richard, would you like to take that? Well, the, we are interested in music education at the moment, and we have groups of teachers around the country, one, in Middles, one based in Middlesbrough, one in near Southampton, and one in Plymouth, working on the development of programmes to help teachers use the micro to teach music. Now, they're, they're looking at things like chord and harmony and scales and so on, a fairly traditional basic syllabus that teachers normally use to do that. Um, and the, there is in some of the magazines recently an address to write to, uh, but the man's name I would think you ought to write to is probably Joe Telford, who comes from Cleveland, and that would give you in contact with the sort of development they're doing. But, uh, Lorraine Boyce, I think you have a comment there. Yes, on the general point of help for teachers, there is quite a lot of help available, but teachers don't always know where to get it. Um, Richard Fothergill's microelectronics education program obviously is doing a sterling job, but there are a lot of other organisations, micros and primary education, micro users in secondary education, that's MAPE and MUSE. Perhaps people could write in and we could let them have a list of addresses. I, I might perhaps just mention here that apart from the MEP, which is English, there is the Scottish SMDP also, which handles the area for teachers in Scotland as well. Thank you. Um, we have another caller on line three, Monica Greeno. Hello, Monica, where are you calling from? Oh, East Ham, that's... The uh... common place, you know. Oh, no, it's wonderful down there. Oh, thank you. What's your question? Uh, well, mine's a sort of audio and visual problem. My eyesight isn't tremendously hot, and I've just started to write programmes on my spectrum, Sinclair Spectrum, and I can't find anything in any book which would tell me how to make bleeping noises when I hit a key, so I don't have to keep looking at the screen after I've typed one letter to see that it's come out. Ah, that's a good one. Henry. There is Henry, budget. There is a command within the spectrum that allows it to make a very faint click, but unfortunately the audio um, output from the spectrum is very low, so you'd hardly be able to hear it. There is um, a modulator adapter that you can build into the spectrum very easily. It just takes three wires to connect. that puts the sound from the spectrum through your own television set, so you get a very loud sound whenever you hit any key on the spectrum's keyboard. It's not that difficult to do. Excellent. Right. That sounds like an answer. We have a caller on line two, Samantha Stevens. Hello, Samantha. Good morning. Hello. Uh, what's your Where are you phoning from, Samantha? Um, Sandstead in Croydon. You sound very young. How old are you? Ten. Ten. What's your question? Well, I have a sick twenty Commodore, and my dad wrote a program called Breakout, where there's a ball and you had to hit bricks out of a wall. Everything worked except the ball didn't move very fast. Could you tell me why? <laughs> this is about how to get a program to work faster. Ian Trackman. Yes. Um, well, there are two answers to this. Uh, the first one is, is to change languages. Basic, which presumably is the language in which your father has written this program, is not a very fast language because it's what we call interpreted. That means each command in the program is taken one at a time and then um, it's put through the computer. So one answer is to change to a faster language. Um, the other answer may just be that the way in which the program is written, um, it's possible to um, increase the speed of the program. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you for calling. We have another caller on line one, Reginald McDermott. Uh, Hello, good morning, Reginald. I wasn't satisfied with the um, sound of my BBC computer. 
and I put a lead into my uh, Toshiba music center, and I seemed to get a flutter, you know, like a sound on vision flutter, caused by presumably the amplification. I wonder if, if I'm doing something wrong. Could you explain why? Who could take that? David? Yeah, I'll try that. I, I'm not quite sure why you're getting the flutter. Maybe you're taking the um, output from the wrong part of it, uh, the wrong part of the printed circuit board. Um, the way you want to go to is two pads on the extreme left of the um, printed circuit board, marked PL16. And th that's what we actually use on the show. And it really does give a very clean sound and goes straight into your amplifier. So try that, I suggest. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have another caller on line one, Reginald McDuck. No, that was Reginald McDermott. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, the whole system's come to a standstill. <laughs> and my line's gone dead. Well, we haven't got any more calls, it seems. I'm being cut off. We did have some letters, though, with lots and lots of questions here. Um, the one I particularly liked was, can you program a computer to be artificially intelligent? I always thought artificial intelligence was the opposite of real stupidity. <laughs> but what is artificial intelligence, Ian? Uh, I, I'm sure that's important. Oh, yes, in that, that is the, the real difficult question. The answer to it is really that every time that uh, uh, computer people make uh, the computer do something that appears clever, they redefine the meaning of artificial intelligence uh, to cover that, to make sure that that extends beyond humans. Um, let me just show you, though, one, one um, idea here. Um, one test may be, can the computer reason? And um, I've got a program here, which uh, we might be able to demonstrate that. Um, and if I type something into the computer like, um, a cow is a ruminant, if I can spell, and a ruminant is not wild, now, we would say if we were intelligent beings, we could uh, draw a conclusion from that and say a cow is not wild, so we'll ask the computer to describe a cow. And it does come up with the answer, a cow is not wild. Well, I don't know really what the answer to the question is, but I can put a question back. Is that in computer intelligent? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a tip. It's not all that intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> Artificial intelligence is a long and complex subject and there's an awful lot of hype going around about what it is and what it isn't and what it can and what it can't do. But it does hold out a lot of promises. In a few minutes we're going to be announcing details of the BBC software competition for schools and I'll be talking to the Minister for Information Technology, Kenneth Baker. Well, successive governments have recognised the important role that microtechnology will play in the future of Britain. Many people are concerned that the new technologies will destroy their jobs. But new jobs are being created and they would need a knowledge of computer techniques. We've been to a place not a stone's throw from here where on the surface there's a ripple of optimism. It's the country's first information technology centre and is housed in an old vicarage in Notting Hill. Back in 1978, the Urban Studies Centre did research into this local area of West London and it was clear that this local economy was both contracting and transforming under the feet of young people. There were two effects of this. One was that less jobs were available, and the second obvious thing was that the jobs that were available had skill requirements which the young people didn't have. Now, we looked at this as a local phenomenon, but we also saw it in the context of what was happening in Europe and the developed world, and it was made particularly difficult by the penetration of information technology. We decided to set up a local response to this analysis, and this, of course, is the Nottingdale Technology Centre, which is next door from this building. There are three main areas of training. Um, one, obviously, is electronics. The second area is what I would call using computers, which is very different from computer studies, as understood in schools, traditionally. The third area would be electronic communication, Prestel style, networking, um, eco-nets, uh, and of course word processing as a, as a function within that. What about we basically here have no academic pre-requirements, so the catchment that we have is very broad indeed. Most of them, to begin with, had no academic qualifications worthy of the name. Uh, youngsters have come from a background as trivial as being space invader freaks, spending their uh, truancy hours down in the West End arcades. We also have youngsters who have self-taught themselves programming. They've probably nicked 
uh, ZX81, some small micro out of WH Smith's, which was one particular case I have in mind, and have taught themselves almost in a play fashion to program on the steps of their flats. Or we have youngsters who are deeply into music, and they've self-taught themselves electronics, which is something many adults and teachers were recognising kids. They've built amplifiers and even synthesizers, uh, and yet they've never done CSE physics or anything of that kind. So there are a very wide range of backgrounds indeed, but they do have a sense this is where it's at in one sense, and they're right. I think this place is a really nice place to come to because uh, if you do something like computer servicing, just learning it, I, I like to learn it because it's so technical and it's really good. It has offered me a lot of experience because um, it's got a lot of facilities that you can learn. Like in electronics, it's got ample amount of tools and things that you can master. The same for computing. And from there, now I've left, I'm now working upstairs, self-employed, with an ex-member of staff servicing computers. So um, we're just starting and hoping for the best. I mean, one thing which is interesting is that on the whole, they've got jobs in the small business sector, however defined. And I think that will be true across Britain because it's clear that information technology penetrates every single occupational grouping uh, that economists can devise. Um, youngsters have got jobs, obviously, in the whole maintenance sectors of this information technology. That doesn't mean just maintenance of hardware, but it also means maintenance of software. Um, they've got jobs as salespersons. They've got jobs um, setting up systems of data for groups like uh, the Community uh, Relations Council and people like this. They have jobs being Prestel operators. We have a couple of youngsters digitising maps for a cartographic company. We have a young lady working in um, the Institute of Mining and Metallurgy as a word processor operator. We have people doing jobs which demand myriad skills. Above our very head here, in fact, there is a, a local microprocessor engineer uh, working with uh, some of our young ex-trainees, now employees, in a company called Digitalent, which has been floated out in a very unconventional fashion between us, the London Borough of Hammersmith, and private money from the businessman himself. They are intending to make and market polyphonic synthesizers for the music market, and as they reach certain levels of throughput, so they will take on more young ex-trainees. Not only that, Nottingdale will begin to make its share of the profit of the sale of the product. So it has a double function, to support more research and development for more products for more companies, and also to create local employment. That's duplicated now five times over. We have five small companies popping out of Nottingdale as a kind of mother company. Well, Mr Baker, will there be other places like that opening up throughout Britain? Yes, there already are 100, and we're going up to 150. And I think you're opening one at Inverness next week, aren't you, Mike? I am indeed, right. yes, that's true. And they are by far the most successful training centres in the country for any skills. The placement rate for jobs is very high. In Toxteth, for example, the placement rate of trainees is 70%. And what is so good about these centres uh, was really came out at the beginning of your programme when you warned against high priests and jargon. And these centres train people who've left school probably with one O-level, a couple of CSEs. They're not double firsts, they're not mathematical wranglers, they're not high priests. But they're people who can cope with these technologies, and you saw them on that film, learning simple things like computer operation, uh, electronic assembly, actually programming. Will there be jobs for them when they come out of this training in well, the long term? Well, the placement rate for these centres is very successful indeed. But the whole of the microelectronics revolution is creating jobs. You know, one's heard a bit on this programme about the BBC Micro. But uh, uh, in 1980, there were, what, 40 people employed by Acorn. Well, now there are about 250. And I've seen around the studio some of the VDUs that Richard Fothergill and others have been using. These are Micro Vitec. Now, that's a company in Bradford that didn't really exist in 1978-79. It employs over 200 people now. So there are jobs actually in the microelectronics industry itself. But as Chris Webb was saying on that film, um, whatever you're in, whether you're in a garage business or engineering business, you have to be able to cope and use microelectronics and computing. I can see the short-term benefits of putting micros in schools. What's the long-term strategic thinking? Well. I would like every youngster who leaves school at 15 or 16 to have actually had hands-on keyboard experience so that they're not shut out from all what's going to affect their lives very profoundly. Because mm -hmm. it is, it's going to affect them in their home, in their jobs. So that's the strategic objective, mm -hmm. to make them computer literate, if you like, to use a fancy phrase. There have been, of course, quite a lot of lower-level jobs, for example, 
I guess three or four years ago, there were no shops actually selling micros. Yes. And that's a whole new area of retail. Oh, yes. Uh, that's big. It's not only in the retail side, but it's also in the software side as well. Uh, I think that in the past, people have tended to concentrate upon the hardware. Mm -hmm. That's like the grand piano. But the grand piano is no good without the music. And it's the software that is the music. And we're very good at writing software. I want to see more software written. I'm very pleased the work that Richard Fothergill is doing up at uh, Newcastle Polytechnic. And more and more software companies are springing up all the time in Britain. He seems to be very, very good at writing software, but we don't seem to be awfully good at selling it. We're kind of <laughs> little England again, and we're not selling it abroad. Uh, have you got any suggestions? Well, there? some of the educational software is now being sold abroad. The, um, I launched a, a scheme for one of the educational publishers, a whole series of projects which are now being translated from English into continental languages. You, you mustn't forget that in the last century, British textbooks spread over the world. Remember Jurel's Algebra, mm -hmm. Kennedy's Latin Primer? Mm -hmm. Well, the textbooks today are those discs that uh, they've been popping into their disk drives. And uh, that's a very big business for us if we can get the act together. And it's quite difficult to get the act together. You've got to get educational publishers. You've got to get the people who are very good at writing the software, usually in the academic world. And don't forget the teachers because some very good software is being written by teachers and sixth formers now. Excellent. I do have one call for you. If you would you prepare to take of a course, telephone yes, call? Yes. We have a call on line one, Andrew Rhodes. Hello, Mr Rhodes. Where are you calling from? Northampton. What's your question? Yes, um, good morning, Minister. Morning. Um, I was just wondering whether there could be any incentives for British companies to buy British technology to, to support the growth of the market over here. For British companies, yes. um, well, the best incentive is that the British technological industry should produce the goods that, in fact, those companies want to buy. We have given direct incentives for schools, of course. Yes. Um, that was the initiative we took two years ago, to provide 50% funding to buy, in fact, British microcomputers. And we've extended that to add-on bits of equipment like VDUs and some of the uh, uh, equipment now for primary schools and secondary schools. So we have taken a definite policy to try to encourage the development of British companies making this equipment. And it's working well. Uh, in Britain, we now have the fastest growing electronic industry in Europe. And I think that that uh, uh, is as a result of a great deal of native talent in Britain, but also quite a bit of encouragement from the government. Yes, I, I deal with a lot of Would companies during, during the course of um, my general work, and a lot of them which are related to, to American companies or associated to them have a policy to buy American equipment. I find it very frustrating that there isn't a sort of reciprocal arrangement, or at least if, the, if certainly the... Um, everything is equal as far as the equipment goes, well, that they would buy from a British company. Well, I think uh, when it was the big mainframes, we have one very good mainframe manufacturer, ICL, but now with the development of the micros and minis, there's a whole range. There are about 40 companies in Britain making micros, and they've all developed in the last three or four years. We've got a real, uh, a, a real breakthrough here, and now we're getting companies in the UK making disk drives and all the other peripherals, like that company, Microvitech. So, so it's really happening here. It's exciting to be in this industry in Britain at this time. Thank you very much for your call, Mr. Rhodes. Also, of course, there are a lot of American companies who have set up manufacturing over oh, here yes. as well. Oh, yes. A uh, tremendous investment. A large number of them. Uh, they've done it because they want to use British brain power and British expertise, quite frankly. Can we go on to this <laughs> software competition, which yes. sounds extremely exciting? Well, this is an exciting competition, which I'm very pleased to announce uh, today. Um, the prizes are £32,500 and it's for schools, for secondary schools. And secondary schools are being asked to invite, uh, to write some software um, uh, about the school or for use in the school or for, uh, it hasn't got to be educational necessarily, be necessarily, possibly the school's relationship with a local community, something like that. Uh, you've got to apply for an entry form in November. Uh, you've got to send in the software by the end of February next year. There'll be regional prizes as well. We're looking for something innovative, interesting, different, and the prizes can be spent on British equipment, or any sort of equipment, I hope British equipment, for the schools. So I hope the youngsters who are watching this program will tell their teachers that they should apply. I hope that if any teachers are watching, as I'm sure they will, they will apply. They should go to it, or if you like to use the computer phrase, go to. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I hope it's successful. There are 48 prizes, I gather, so it's not yes. just one or two. And the first oh, yes. prize is, is how much? It is £5,000. 
kind. Well, if you want more details, you can get an entry form. You just write at the address that will be given to you at the end of the programme. Thank you very much, Minister. It's also been given in this week's Radio Time on page 83. Well, let's have a look at how our own software writers have been getting on. Two hours isn't a very long time to write any sort of program, so they're really, to some extent, throwing it together, particularly under these sort of conditions where if anything's going to go wrong, it will go wrong. But the only thing that has gone wrong so far is the clock. Right, would you like to run your program? Right, well, it's running at the moment. It now, uh, as well as previously, it was just displaying the thing, now it also flashes the colours. We also have a few more fill-ins, as you call them, sort of between each one. This is one. Um, it's going rather slowly, but uh, keep going. Um, <laughs> and then it will cycle around to another one. And you can fast forward. To need a ticket, we can fix it. Smudge Enterprises, I see. So you've, right. you've you can got... cycle through the colours very fast if you need to go, which will then go on to the next fill-in and so on. So you can fast forward, or, or it'll just wait. If you just leave it all alone, it'll just go at their own speed. Did you just code it up yourself? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you didn't write any sort of flowcharts in there. There's one or two little pieces of code you wrote yeah, down Yes, so the piece of code you've written down, but no flowcharts. Could we just list the program out and have exactly. a look at it? Yeah. Um, basically, at the end, there's all the subroutines there for the square. I see. So you've got all of them basically in procedures, yeah. I see. Right, yes. How many lines of code is it, approximately? Uh, well, it's uh, 150, roughly. roughly. And there's the various data for the ads at the end. Do you think it would work? I mean, do you think it would be usable? Oh, yes, yes. It does actually work. It, 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 it's fairly reliable, as far as we can tell so far. What so, else would you have to do with it to make it really into a saleable programme, do you think? Perhaps put a few more things in, like we were thinking at one point of putting in um, arrows pointing into its centre uh -huh. as another eye-catching thing. Could you write um, again? Yeah. Yeah, Alan's news agent. It just Station. cycles around. There's about four or five ads. And it just keeps cycling around. It's a 15 second wait. Have you got on, man? Run. Um, not too bad. Not too bad. We didn't do all the screens. We had lots of ideas for putting some graphics in uh, to display a picture of what they were trying to sell or advertise. Um, but really, just not enough time to do that. So we've done a different, several different sorts of text um, in different colours. This um, is on the RML machine, isn't it, the 4 right. I'm not really too familiar with that. Oh, that's nice. Um, so that's just sort of to catch people's attention. And then there's some letters with some shadow um, to make it stand out. Um. <laughs> Two of them deserve a fair dream. Titler, that's our director. Is he selling his motorbike? Perhaps you'd <laughs> after this programme. <laughs> um, and I think it's probably about the same length as... Yeah. About, about 150, 150 lines of, of code. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, what would you do to improve it if you had more time? Throw it away and start again. Well, <laughs> one, one thing I'd certainly do is I'd write a, a lot more machine code in it for doing you know, fast animated graphics and things. A motorcycle running across right. the screen, that sort of thing. You need speed and colour to catch people's eye. Really. Yeah, of course, the news agent himself would have to be able to write his own adverts in, wouldn't it? So it would have to be very easy to use. That would be quite... Usually the, the parts of inter, you know, inputting data into a big programme is quite hard to get it right to make sure you've got the correct data in. Yeah, yeah. The news agent would have, uh, have to have quite a big interface at the front, wouldn't it? Yes, we were told not to, not to bother doing oh, that. Oh, no, I know. But, I'm just talking could. about generally. Yes, that indeed, would be quite that a that longish piece of programme to make it into a complete exercise so he could just simply type in on Would you put it on a series of menus or something like that? Something like that. You've got to take into account the fact that he's probably going to make a lot of mistakes. So you've got to programme to take that into account. Whereas if you've got an experienced user, you can make, write a very much more simple programme um, because you know what he's going to enter into the keyboard. In doing it under the short time frame, did you put any crash proofing in? No, none at all. <laughs> Yeah. Did you do that? Virtually none. I mean, there's no real crash proofing to put in because we're not allowing the user to do very much with it. Um, it's just running the programme. We are going to make these programmes available, by the way, to anybody who writes in for them and who might like to use them. Charles, how have you got on? Well, uh, not, not too bad. We've got, uh, we've got the double height characters working OK. And as you see, it's drawing rather slowly because uh, we're actually doing all kinds of dirty machine code tricks, actually getting the character pattern from the ROM and in BASIC taking it up bit by bit and putting it on the screen uh, because there's nothing within the BASIC. In machine code, it would be almost instantaneous, and so uh, that's one improvement I'd make. Having done that and got everything nicely centred up, uh, we went to try and put some colours into it, and we were hoping, and you see there's a slightly different behaviour at the top, we were hoping for a sort of flashing highlight on the, on the main title there, but uh, it never came about. It didn't quite work, uh, so we went back to an old version.
This is a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. That's that's by far the cheapest machine in this it's range. A, it's, it's a cheap cheap machine, and in some some respect, it's very good. It has very large memory and, and that. But uh, the basic, uh, well, it just doesn't have large character within its basic. And so, if you want large characters, you have to go outside the basic. What would you have done to improve it if you'd had more time? I think the, the sort of thing I'd go for is an animated character, sort of pulling the characters on by string or something like that. Something uh, something really fun. for sale rotating. Right, so uh -huh. it's a, a moving display. We did think of doing that, but it takes, as you see, it takes so long to actually draw it in basic that it would have been painful on the eye. Right. What else would you do? Could we have a list of it? Sure. <laughs> How many instructions did it was yours? It probably was pretty long, wasn't it? Yes. Mm. Well, it's not that long. It's not that long. Too bad. No, it's about the same as the other. Mm. Have you anything else you'd do if you could spend more time on it to improve it? Well, I think I'd throw it away and start again. As <laughs> everybody <laughs> said. Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, that's what you do in practice uh, when, you're, when you're programming. Uh, you write something up and you look at it and you realize your mistakes and you start all over again. And that's the strength of BASIC in that you can get things going very quickly. Uh, and we do that. It's always slow, but at least you get a rough idea what, it is, what it's about. So even in machine code, I'd start this way. Well, thanks a lot and thank all of you for your bold and brave efforts and everybody else who has been in the studio. Well, next year, as well as a new series on robots, we're also doing one on the electronic office or the office of the future or whatever it's called. We'll let you know when we find out. That's it. Have a good lunch. Goodbye. And a fact sheet which gives more information about the BBC's computer literacy project and the entry forms for the BBC software competition for schools are both available by sending a self-addressed envelope 12 inches by 9 with a 21 pence stamp to Broadcasting Support Services, PO Box 7, London W36XJ. And don't forget to indicate which item it is that you require. And a reminder that the entry forms for the software competition are only available to schools. You can also find that address on page 83 of this week's Radio Times.